Welcome to our devotion for today. And let's start this with a prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks, Lord, for this wonderful day you have given us that we're still alive, able to give you thanks and praise. Help us, Lord, to understand what you're telling us. We're able, Lord, to put this into action. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Who can list the glorious miracles of the Lord? Who can ever praise Him enough? There is joy for those who deal justly with others and always do what is right. Remember me, Lord, when you show favor to your people. Come near and rescue me. Let me share in the prosperity of your chosen ones. Let me rejoice in the joy of your people. Let me praise you with those who are your heritage. Like our ancestors, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly. Our ancestors in Egypt were not impressed by the Lord's miraculous deeds. They soon forgot his many acts of kindness to them. Instead, they rebelled against him at the Red Sea. Even so, he saved them to defend the honor of his name and to demonstrate his mighty power. He commanded the Red Sea to dry up. He led Israel across the sea as if it were a desert. So he rescued them from their enemies and redeemed them from their foes. Then the water returned and covered their enemies. Not one of them survived. Then his people believed his promises. Then they sang his praise. Yet how quickly they forgot what he had done. They wouldn't wait for his counsel. In the wilderness, their desires ran wild, testing God's patience in that dry wasteland. So he gave them what they asked for but he sent a plague along with it. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need, and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to, <coughs> to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift, too wonderful for words. Chapter 14 A Taunt for Babylon's King But the Lord will have mercy on the descendants of Jacob. He will choose Israel as his special people once again. He will bring them back to settle once again in their own land. And people from many different nations will come and join them there and unite with the people of Israel. The nations of the world will help the Lord's people to return, and those who come to live in their land will serve them. Those who captured Israel will themselves be captured, and Israel will rule over its enemies. In that wonderful day, when the Lord gives his people rest from sorrow and fear, from slavery and change, you will taunt the king of Babylon. He will say, The mighty man has been destroyed. Yes, your insolence is ended. For the Lord has crushed your wicked power and broken your evil rule. You struck the people with endless blows of rage and held the nations in your angry grip with unrelenting tyranny. But finally the earth is at rest and quiet. Now it can sing again. Even the trees of the forest the cypress trees and the cedars of Lebanon sing out this joyous song. Since you have been cut down, no one will come now to cut us down. In the place of the dead, there is excitement 
over your arrival. The spirits of world leaders and mighty kings long dead stand up to see you. With one voice they all cry out, Now you are as weak as we are. Your might and power were buried with you. The sound of the harp in your palace has ceased. Now maggots are your sheet and worms your blanket. How you are fallen from heaven. O shining star, son of the morning, you have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. Instead, you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths. Everyone there will stare at you and ask, Can this be the one who shook the earth and made the kingdoms of the world tremble? Is this the one who destroyed the world and made it into a wasteland? Is this the king who demolished the world's greatest cities and had no mercy on his prisoners? The kings of the nations lie in stately glory, each in his own tomb. But you will be thrown out of your grave like a worthless branch, like a corpse trampled underfoot. You will be dumped into a mass grave with those killed in battle. You will descend to the pit. You will not be given a proper burial, for you have destroyed your nation and slaughtered your people. The descendants of such an evil person will never again receive honor. Kill this man's children. Let them die because of their father's sins. They must not rise and conquer the earth, filling the world with their cities. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. I myself have risen against Babylon. I will destroy its children and its children's children, says the Lord. I will make Babylon a desolate place of owls, filled with swamps and marshes. I will sweep the land with the broom of destruction. I, the Lord of Heaven's armies, have spoken. A message about Assyria. The Lord of Heaven's armies has sworn this oath. It will all happen as I have planned. It will be as I have decided. I will break the Assyrians when they are in Israel. I will trample them on my mountains. My people will no longer be their slaves, nor bow down under their heavy loads. I have a plan for the whole earth a hand of judgment upon all the nations. The Lord of Heaven's armies has spoken. Who can change his plans? When his hand is raised, who can stop him? A message about Philistia. This message came to me the year King Ahaz died. Do not rejoice, you Philistines, that the rod that struck you is broken, that the king who attacked you is dead. For from that snake a more poisonous snake will be born, a fiery serpent to destroy you. I will feed the poor in my pasture. The needy will lie down in peace. But as for you, I will wipe you out with famine and destroy the few who remain. Wail at the gates. Weep in the cities. Melt with fear, you Philistines. A powerful army comes like smoke from the north. <coughs> Each soldier rushes forward, eager to fight. What should we tell the Philistine messengers? Tell them the Lord has built Jerusalem. Its walls will give refuge to his oppressed people. People. Chapter 15 A Message About Moab This message came to me concerning Moab. In one night, the town of Ayr will be leveled, and the city of Kerr will be destroyed. Your people will go to their temple in Debon to mourn. They will go to their sacred shrines to weep. They will wail for the fate of Nebo and Mediba, shaving their heads in sorrow and cutting off their beards. They will wear burlap as they wander the streets. From every home and public square will come the sound of wailing. The people of Heshbon and Eliela will cry out. Their voices will be heard as far away as Jahaz. The bravest warriors of Moab will cry out in utter terror. They will be helpless with fear. My heart weeps for Moab. Its people flee to Zoar and Eglath Shalishia. Weeping, they climb the road to Luith. Their cries of distress can be heard all along the road to Horonaim. Even the waters of Nimrim are dried up. The grassy banks are scorched. The tender plants are gone. Nothing green remains. The people grab their possessions and carry them across the ravine of willows.
A cry of distress echoes through the land of Moab, from one end to the other, from Eglaim to Ber Elam. The stream near Debon runs red with blood, but I am still not finished with Debon. Lions will hunt down the survivors, both those who try to escape and those who remain behind. Chapter 16 Send lambs from Selah as tribute to the ruler of the land. Send them through the desert to the mountain of beautiful Zion. The women of Moab are left like homeless birds at the shallow crossings of the Arnon River. Help us, they cry. Defend us against our enemies. Protect us from their relentless attack. Do not betray us now that we have escaped. Let our refugees stay among you. Hide them from our enemies until the terror is past. When oppression and destruction have ended and enemy raiders have disappeared, then God will establish one of David's descendants as king. He will rule with mercy and truth. He will always do what is just and be eager to do what is right. We have heard about proud Moab, about its pride and arrogance and rage. But all that boasting has disappeared. The entire land of Moab weeps. Yes, everyone in Moab mourns for the cakes of raisins from Kir Hariseth. They are all gone now. The farms of Heshbon are abandoned. The vineyards at Sibma are deserted. The rulers of the nations have broken down Moab, that beautiful grapevine. Its tendrils spread north as far as the town of Jazer and trailed eastward into the wilderness. Its shoots reached so far west that they crossed over the Dead Sea. So now I weep for Jazer and the vineyards of Sibma. My tears will flow for Heshbon and Eliela. There are no more shouts of joy over your summer fruits and harvest. Gone now is the gladness, gone the joy of harvest. There will be no singing in the vineyards, no more <coughs> happy shouts, no treading of grapes in the wine presses. I have ended all their harvest joys. My heart's cry for Moab is like a lament on a harp. I am filled with anguish for Kir Hariseth. The people of Moab will worship at their pagan shrines, but it will do them no good. They will cry to the gods in their temples, but no one will be able to save them. The Lord has already said these things about Moab in the past, but now the Lord says, within three years, counting each day, the glory of Moab will be ended. From its great population, only a few of its people will be left alive. Ch 6. Praise the Lord. This is the Bible in Wenyet, day 250. Ten reasons to give generously. Mick Hawkins was the most generous person I've ever met. He was always giving and always offering to pay for everything. We thought he must be very rich. Actually, he wasn't. He was just very generous. His life overflowed with thankfulness for God's grace. This opened his heart and his wallet in a way that inspired all who knew him. I want to be like Mick. I long for the Church of Jesus Christ to be full of people like him. Because as we see in today's passage, grace, thanksgiving and generosity are very closely connected. Psalm 106. Thank God for grace by your worship. When we begin to experience God's grace, gratitude is the natural and appropriate response. The psalmist is overwhelmed by gratitude and worships God, saying, Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. He goes on to say, We've sinned a lot. We've fallen short, hurt a lot of people forgot your great and wonderful love. They've rebelled against God. Years ago, by this psalm, I wrote in the margin of my Bible, I sometimes wonder whether I sin more than any other Christian. How can God go on forgiving? If you feel like that sometimes, you're not alone. But the next verse starts with the word yet. This is grace in spite of everything. He saved them for his name's sake. He led them. He redeemed them. As a result of God's amazing grace, they believed his promises and sang his praise. But they soon forgot what he'd done and did not wait for his counsel. Again, I've written in my margin, this is the history of my Christian life. For a day or two, or even a week or two, I believe his promises and sing his praises. But then I soon go out and forget what he's done and fail to wait for his counsel or ask his advice about everything. Let's not be as they were, complaining every step of the way 
and always wanting what they did not have. They lusted exceedingly, and God gave them their request, but sent leanness into their souls. Sometimes God says, your will be done, and gives people what they asked for, even if it's not the best thing for them. Rather than craving after more, enjoy and thank God for what you have through his grace and kindness to you. Lord, thank you for your amazing grace and forgiveness, that you've redeemed me and you lead me. Help me to believe your promises, sing your praise, and not forget what you have done for me. New Testament, 2 Corinthians 9. Thank God for grace by your giving. In this passage, Paul gives us at least 10 reasons to give generously. First, giving is the best investment you can make. Like the harvest, giving is planting seed. The farmer will reap far more than what is sown. A stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. This applies to everything in life. What you give to the Lord, he multiplies. Your time, gifts, ambitions, and money. Second, giving should be fun. Giving should never be forced or grudging, but rather voluntary and cheerful, for God loves a cheerful giver. The Greek word for cheerful is hilaros. We always quiff at HTB that our giving should be hilarious. It should be fun to give. Generosity leads to happiness. Third, giving takes away the burden of financial worry. Paul writes, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. Giving does not mean handing over financial responsibility to God, but it does mean handing over the worry and the burden of it. Fourth, giving enriches you. When God invites you to give, he's appealing not just to your emotions, but also to your reason. Thus, you will be enriched in all things and in every way, so you can be generous. Materially, you will have enough to give away generously. Your characters will be enriched. God will be praised. Fifth, giving transforms your character. Paul speaks of the harvest of your righteousness. Giving purges the character from the constricting grip of materialism that destroys lives. Sixth, giving inspires others. Your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Because of the service of which you approved yourselves, people will praise God. Seventh, giving meets people's needs. Generous giving blesses other people and supplies the needs of God's people, helping meet the bare needs of poor Christians. Eighth, giving is evidence of real faith. Generous giving is an act of obedience which should accompany your confession of the gospel of Christ. Giving is an act of trust. In doing it, you're saying that it is God, not yourself or anyone else who ultimately provides for your needs. Ninth, giving makes you a stakeholder in the church. Paul speaks of your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. In the same way as when you share a flat or apartment, you share in the bills. As you share in the needs of the community, you reap the benefits of that community. For example, every time someone comes to know Christ through the community, you share in the blessing. Tenth, giving is a response to God's gift to you. God so loved you that he gave his one and only son so that you might have eternal life. Our giving is a response to God's amazing grace. His indescribable gift is the gift of his son. Thank God for this gift, his gift. No language can praise it enough. Lord, thank you for the indescribable gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Help me to respond with generosity and grace to your amazing grace. Old Testament. Isaiah 14 to 16. Thank God for his grace in your life. How do we explain the evil of ISIS, beheadings, crucifixions of Christians and Yusadis, women and children sold into slavery? How do we explain, for example, the Holocaust, Stalin's exterminations, or the Rwandan genocide? 
This is one of the few passages in the Bible that hints at the origins of Satan and demonic powers. The beauty of a diamond is best seen against a black velvet cloth. The beauty of God's grace is also seen in its full glory and brilliance against the darkness of evil. The prophet Isaiah speaks of God's amazing compassion. The dark background is the evil of the nations around, in particular Babylon's cruelty, torture, persecution and slave trade. Isaiah describes Babylon's fall. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. You were brought down to the grave, to the depth of the pit. Jesus similarly describes Satan's fall. Perhaps it was pride and arrogance that led to the angelic fall before the fall of Adam and Eve. But against this dark background, there is also a hint of a beautiful diamond. The tyrant toppled, the killing at an end. All signs of these cruelties long gone. A new government of love will be established. In the venerable David tradition, a ruler you can depend upon will head this government. A ruler passionate for justice, a ruler quick to set things right. Whatever the historical fulfillment may have been, there is only one person who perfectly fits this description, Jesus the Messiah, born in the line of David, who brought together God's love and his justice, unlike the satanic, I will. Jesus denied himself and said, not what I will, but what you will. The only appropriate response to God's amazing grace revealed in Jesus Christ is to give him thanks with your worship, your giving, and your whole lives, to surrender your life to him and say, I'm willing to do whatever you want. Whatever you're facing, you can trust that God's purposes will ultimately be accomplished. For the Lord Almighty has purposed, and who can thwart him? Lord, thank you that we experience your amazing grace, love, and faithfulness in Jesus. Thank you that he seeks justice and speeds the cause of righteousness. Help me, like him, to have a concern for the poorest of the poor and the needy, and to give generously. Lord, thank you again for this time of worship, a time of devotion. Help us to really remember this and apply this in our life. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us in the devotion and hopefully to see you again in the next one. God bless us all and bye-bye.